welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hey folks, and welcome to this week's episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. We are touching base with Andy Lamont, who had a rather unfortunate start to his westward bound solo unassisted circumnavigation of the globe in his SNS 34 called Impulse. So catching up with Andy, um, he was on his boat uh, in Sydney after undergoing uh, some repairs. Um, so we're going to talk to Andy about what he learned on his shakedown trip and, and uh, certainly the lessons he shares reinforces the importance of a shakedown trip before you head off on a big voyage, particularly if you've uh, done a lot of refitting uh, or you were heading off uh, and doing something you haven't done before. So it's quite a candid catch up with Andy, but it was, um, it was great to have a chat. So, and then before we get into uh, episode 30, um, I sort of reflect on uh, my uh, racing over the last uh, couple of weeks just uh, at the Southport Yacht Club. We've got twilight racing we do on Thursdays inside Broadwater, which uh, due to tidal flows can have us racing in one to sort of three knots of current uh, in and out of channels and very shallow areas uh, and in areas where the breeze fluctuates a lot depending on whether you're close to land or away from land and then we do offshore uh, offshore racing as well up and down the coast uh, which is pretty cool so um the theme uh, the last the, the, the theme for the last week really for me in terms of lessons has been mark rounding um we had an incident where uh, we were offshore racing uh, and a boat ahead of us went around um, a mark um, that was anchored by a line and, and probably in you know, 30 metres of water. And, and unfortunately for them, as they went around the mark, they went a little bit too close, wrapped their keel around the the uh, mark line itself and ended up having to cut the marker free to be able to continue the race. So, you know, it just it just reminds you that if, you, if you're racing for several hours, sometimes the difference of two or three metres despite how impressive it looks on uh, America's Cup. Um, sometimes the extra two or three metres of, uh, of, of getting close um, isn't, isn't, isn't worth the risk. If you happen to mis- misjudge it, if there's too much line hanging down and, and the mark's not hanging straight up and down, it's hanging sort of sideways in the tide or the breeze and you, and you catch it. And, and, um, and just to sort of back that up, I had a twilight race the other day where, where mark rounding was also an issue uh, inside the broad water. And uh, again, another great lesson breeze was five to six knots the course was inside the broad water uh, and uh, in the main channel tide was running at uh, two to two point eight knots um, so we had that with us and against us uh, and, and then partway through the race we had this upwind leg we were coming up wind against sort of two two and a half knots of tide we got right out of the tide uh, into shallow water where the tide maybe dropped to a knot and the challenge was then judging the ley line to tack back across the channel to round the mark on the other side. And so despite having good good navigation gear, I've got BNG gear where it gives you ley lines, unfortunately it's taking the ley lines on what the current is where you are in shallow water, not what the current is in the main channel. So if you take those ley lines as gospel, of course as soon as you head back out of shallow water back into the main channel when their head tide doubles then the ley lines are out the window so in this particular example we went uh, probably an extra seven or eight bow links to what the ley line said uh, trying to anticipate the the, the cross current um, as we tacked we were miles above the the ley line or so it appeared but as we got across the channel into the main body of water it became really clear where we were going to we were going to struggle to lay the mark or just lay it. Um, and, and we ended up just laying it, and, which was great. But what really reinforced to me the value of overlaying a mark in strong tide instead of losing boat speed through having to tack additional times is the two of the boats behind us who, who weren't successful in laying the mark, um, who, who, who had been together with at the previous mark, suddenly one of them ended, ended up maybe... Uh, 100 meters behind us, the other one 300 meters behind us in the space of a few minutes. One of them put in four extra tacks, I think, and one of them put in five or maybe six extra tacks. Uh, and, and the trouble was when you're tacking in slow breeze against current, then it really exponentially kind of creates a bigger problem because, of course, every time you slow down to tack, every time you come out of a tack, if you're only doing two knots of boat speed and the, and the tide's running at two knots uh, in the opposite direction, 
then then every time before you build up speed, um, you know, you throw an attack again, try to get around a mark, you can end up misjudging it several times in a row. So I just thought it was a great lesson. Uh, the, the value of sailing, you know, an extra 30 seconds, overlaying a mark in strong tide, because in that case, um, it probably saved us two, three, four, five minutes if we look at the finish times for that race, just because of those other boats putting extra attacks and misjudging it versus um, versus us overlaying it like we did and having that extra sort of runway in the bank um, as we came across in that stronger current. So just sort of share that. Um, I do a lot of racing and and um, and sometimes these lessons are, uh, are, are, are they're always good in theory, but until you see them in, not only in action, but if you see the impact on other boats who do different things, you don't always appreciate how much of a difference they can make. So. Tip for the week. Uh, so enjoy this week's episode with Andy Lamont, episode 30, as we catch up with him and find out what happened when he left uh, uh, the Gold Coast a month ago, um, how he ended up parked in Sydney, and what's happening next in terms of his uh, world record attempt to sail uh, westbound in a boat under 40 foot in length, non-stop, unassisted, around the world. So enjoy. <laughs> Hey, good morning, Andy. Uh, thanks for joining us this week on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Uh, it's an uh, un- unusual circumstances you find yourself in, so it's, I thought it'd be good to have a catch up. Given we've had a lot of uh, a lot of correspondence from uh, podcast listeners asking how your trip's going, so do you want to give us a bit of an update and tell us how you ended up stopping off in uh, Sydney and parking at the CYCA for a couple of weeks? Yeah. Uh, well. Um to sort of go back to the start, we had a, a fairly good start to the to the voyage and had a nice little northerly to start with. And uh, uh, so for the first day, it was pretty good. But by the night time on the, the second day, as soon as I turned my power on, I noticed that I got my nav lights on, I noticed I was drawing um, you know, uh, two amps uh, and um, or two amp hours. And I was a bit... Uh, just just from running the nav lights, so uh, I thought I must have had some kind of a short in there. So I started hunt, trying to hunt that down. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, uh, you know the the wind picked up, but for the first night it wasn't too bad. But um, we were losing. Uh, I was I was basically running out of batteries uh, to run the nav lights, so I sort of stuck on a tack that took me out to sea a little bit more. And uh, and then I, I, by the end of the night, I'd uh, you know used about twenty five or thirty amps of power, and uh, and then um, the wind generator that I had that just uh, um, was working quite well. But then it just uh, as the wind picked up to about thirty five knots, it just stopped working. Right. And uh, and and then uh, then I had a problem with the solar panel regulator, and so then that started that stopped working. Uh, and uh, so um, the second day was, uh, you know, it was still quite good. It was, uh, it was still going northerly, and I was enjoying myself. But uh, I was sort of hunting down, trying to find out what the problem with the power was, and all this power consumption that was going on. So, uh, and then uh, then we got uh, uh, sort of southerly change, and um, and the boat was going quite nicely. I was under two reefs. It was about thirty five. Um, and uh, two reefs and a storm jib, and it was just you know quite comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the um, the wind generator started to sort of smell like it was going to catch on fire. It was just really, really, um, really uh, starting to get hot and, wow. and smelly. So I um, was a bit worried about that, uh, and uh, and uh, then uh, but that was okay and. Um, then I, uh, so it was sort of, I was still trying to, as night arrived, I was still trying to figure out why I was using so much power at night time, uh, running the nav lights. Uh, and, uh, and then, um, well, that was okay. And then that, uh, I'm just going to be confused now because days are running to, to one another. But eventually, um, we, we, we ran for, for, uh, ran into two southerly fronts. Mm-hmm. Um, which were, you know, they weren't that bad. They were like 35 to 45 knots. Um, the uh, the Fleming wind vane was doing a fantastic job. Just it, it was just steering the boat really well. But um, I was, just was having this problem with power. And then um, 
in the middle of the night. I was uh, uh, just, uh, you know, hunkered down there. I was inside reading a book, actually. It was about 35 to 40 knots. Mm-hmm. And the, um, the furler, just uh, the furling line just pulled right out of the furler. So I had the, had the head sail, which was a number three, uh, completely furled up uh, and uh, had the um, storm jib out. And the head sail uh, just basically unzipped. Oh, wow. um, and so... It was one of those things that you know, um, where the uh, it was a, it's a good quality furler, um, but it was a second hand one that I because I'd got I'd used my one which was a new one on the uh, storm jib mm-hmm. which had a smaller um, smaller diameter four stay in it and got a bigger one a bigger diameter four stay for the um, oversized one for the for the main head so I thought I was doing the right thing, but the. When you look at these things inside, you case they're second hand. It all looked okay, but the um, attachment point to where the um, the furling line attaches inside the drum must have been weakened at some point in the past, and so it just let go. And uh, so then it was uh, then it was a lot of fun because the heads all just unfurled, and it was mm. by then it was sort of about forty knots. And forty knots with your heads all <laughs> flapping itself to death. That's pretty <laughs> hard to. It's dangerous to under control. Yeah. So you know, I had to, uh, so I had to turn down wind and try and get the headsail behind the main, and um, and then I, uh, you know, basically um, in the process of like wrapping it up, I got I got it tied it to the. I tried to first of all, I tried to let it down, yeah, to bring it down, but uh, basically I got about like, you know, probably a meter and a half or two meters of it down. And then it just unzipped from the top to the bottom. So that, and uh, so then it was just attached at the uh, at the furler and and at the uh, at the um, at the uh, top end of the furler. Right. So it was just attached at two points. Uh-huh. And it was just like a going crazy. Oh. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so I I uh, tied it off the, to, the foot off to the to the pulpit and to the. Uh, to the staunchers and the lifelines, and, and I had a, um, a, a spinnaker pole, so I tied as much as I could off to that. Uh, and then it was still flapping like crazy, and finally I figured out, after a while, I didn't figure this out straight away, but I got a, um, uh, a spare jib halyard and uh, wrapped it around and around and around mm-hmm. the uh, head sail, and then that sort of tightened it all up and made, made a nice little neat ball of it. Mm-hmm. But uh, one of the things I found out when I got back into Sydney was that all that flogging um, had actually uh, worked the pulpit. And um, wow. so then the pulpit was basically leaking um, into the watertight compartment in front of the boat, which was filling up with water, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so um, you know, in hindsight now, I'll put a drain in that watertight compartment but uh, and uh, I've really beefed up the, the pulpit as well with a – with a, uh, it's got a stainless steel strap right across the foredeck, foredeck and, and it's bolted in the strap, and there's a strap underneath. So it's, 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 uh, it's really strong now. But uh, it's one of those things that, you know, I looked at it and it's just a standard pulpit and I thought, you know, it's got four bolts, it should be all right. But, you know, it um, underneath there's a stainless steel, uh, there was a stainless steel um, uh, backing plate yeah. which bridged the gap between... There's a little gap between where the the core of the deck goes up and the uh, uh, and the um, and the uh, tow rail bolts to the um, to the to the hull, mm-hmm. and that binds the, the the deck and the hull together. And there's a gap there. And what happened was, as it was flogging, it just bent that backing plate, mm-hmm. just created a tiny little bit of movement there, and that was enough to sort of break the sicker seal. And, and uh, so yeah, so so um so the. the by this point, you know the the uh, I couldn't pull the the um, the uh, the jib down or the the headsail down. It was just like stuck and yeah. the top part had torn, and there was a bolt rope stuck inside the track. Mm-hmm. So that bolt rope, you, to try and get it down, you know, you would I couldn't get it down. So I was sort of then then at a decision. I still couldn't figure out why I was using all this power. Uh, my head sail, the number three head sail was pretty much, you know, like needed some major, major work. I could have fixed it, but 
yeah. you know, it, it would have been, a, um, you know, always a bit sort of suspect. Uh, and um, and uh, so I made I sort of made the decision then that uh, look, there's a few things about the boat that were, um, you know, that we sort of packed up and we left in a hurry in the last week and. Um, I, I could have pushed on, but I, but I was probably thinking I'm going to be pushing on, yeah. relying mostly on the storm jib, not on the on the head sail. And um, well, giving you three so, days into a 300 day journey, that's a big, yeah, big, big yeah. sacrifice, so, make, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a tough decision to make because I didn't really, really didn't want to do it. But in no. the end, I just thought, look, you know, I'll just come in, restart, uh, and. Uh, you know, at the time I was really, you know, really had a lot of angst about it because um, my big rival, who was also going for the record, Bill Hatfield, was, uh, he was, I was, uh, what's Bill Hatfield doing? And he, he was in the middle of the Australian bite. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he was carrying on and I was thinking, oh, I'm going to pull into Sydney and I'll, you know, I'll lose <laughs> more days, I'll be behind him. And, uh, and in the end, but I just thought in the end, look, you know, it was, it's about completing the journey and if yeah. you you know, I could stop and I can start here again with a much better boat. There's a whole lot of things that as I came down, I realised, you know, it could have been better. Uh, um, you know, the solar panels were, you know, I was just relying, because the regulator um, just stopped working and then it turned out they had a bit of water damage um, uh, because, you know, one of the kind people that were helping me before I left it um, plugged up the hole Um so I thought it was a hole in the uh, – there was a hole in the cockpit and they plugged it up with some epoxy. Yeah. It was actually the drain for – there was a cockpit drain, so that drain wasn't working. So that right. drain backfilled and then water ran down inside the cockpit – inside right. the uh, uh, boat and tracked down into the regulator. So the regulator um, got water damage and that stopped working. So it was, it was um, you know, one of those things where – you know, I had one solar panel, which was um, a spare emergency solar panel, which was enough to um, enough to to get a little bit of power back into the batteries. Yeah. Uh, I did have a spare wind generator, um, but the regular I didn't know what was so before I left. Um, we had a problem with the wind generator regulator, so uh, the the guys who supplied it were really great, and they. They gave me a new regulator, no questions asked. We put that new regulator on, and the wind generator and it uh, stopped working. So they actually then said, "Right, we'll give you a whole new wind generator mm -hmm. and a whole new regulator." Um, so and then that stopped working on the way down. So I was, um, I was, uh, you know, even though I had a spare wind generator on board, I wasn't very confident that it was actually going to work because no. this is now. The third, or the, the the second wind generator and the third regulator I'd been through in three weeks. So yeah. I was, uh, so I thought, look, I'll, I'll pull in, and uh, and so we did. And you know, luckily, or, or you know, when I when I spoke to the guys from Stella, they said uh, they got on the phone to um, England and said, "What the hell's going on?" And then uh, they found out that there was a faulty regulator in all the diode, all, faulty diode in all the regulators. They'd supplied uh, with these new wind generators, yeah. And so basically, they just did a general recall on all of them, and uh, wow. and uh, so it's pretty so it wouldn't have mattered if they sent me down another regulator or another unit yeah. or whatever. Yeah. It just wasn't going to work. So, um, so luckily uh, they were really good, at that and they got back onto that. And uh, so basically, I'm just running now um, the the old pride and tested uh, 914 wind generator uh, and I've got two of them and uh, and then while I was down here I, I sort of right sort of uh, get right on top of the solar panel so I've got two more solar panels yeah on top of my dodger yeah uh, two small ones uh, that are that are movable around the boat plus the two that are on the uh, uh, on the targa mm -hmm. and and I've got uh, you know um, five regulators on the boat and that are, that are working. So all the solar panels go to their own separate regulators and I'm taking a, a few spare as well. So uh, so I should be fine for power generation. Yeah. And the other thing that happened was that when I had the mast out, we had a big conversation about, 
you know, getting the right LED bulb to put in the uh, the mm-hmm. tricolour on top of the mast. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it was just one of those jobs that, that just fell through the cracks and wasn't done. So all this time when I was using all this power, I'm going, I, you know, I couldn't understand it because I knew the LED bulb was only going to be drawing, you know, 0.1 and a half to maximum 0.2 of an amp hour. Yeah. Uh, and, and I was drawing two and a half amps, so I thought there must have been a major problem. Mm-hmm. Anyway, when I got to Sydney, you know, I just – I was here a couple of days and I had, uh, you know, uh, Harold from uh, AC Electrics on the Gold Coast has flown down three times and um, we had him on the boat and, uh, and, I just, and we just said, well, we'll just get up, climb up the mast and double-check the bowl. And I climbed up the mast and uh, there was the uh, – old incandescent oh, bulb in the tricolour, <laughs> which was the cause of all the problems. So, oh, you poor baby. So, so yeah, and, and I didn't have a spare uh, uh, LED bulb with me, so if I hadn't pulled in, I would have sort of, you know, gone around the world just always, you know, freaking out because I couldn't uh, couldn't afford to run my, my navigation lights mm. at 20 amps a night, you know, like it's just too much. So. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the wind generator was one that was outside my control and outside the, you know, the importer's control and it was just one of those things that, uh, that um, was, uh, um, you know, a problem that probably, we, we, you know, we might have been able to foresee but we sort of reasonably didn't think that there was going to be a problem with that. Yeah. Uh, the regulator, um, you know, again, filling up with water was – Really, you know, just, uh, you know, probably my fault for not just keeping an eye on what was going on with it. I had a lot of people in the last week just on the boat helping out and, um, you know, uh, just someone, you know, in all good faith just, just blocking up that drain because yeah. they thought it was a hole. Because um, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't look like a drain. It's just like it looks like a hole mm-hmm. in, the, in the side of the cockpit. Uh, you know, that was probably that, – that definitely was my fault, not for, you know, for, for not keeping a close enough eye on that. And the, uh, and, and the light bulb, uh, you know, in the mask, definitely, you know, I should have – those are the things. That, so a couple of things I just didn't double-check, you yeah. know, to make sure they were right, and, and that was definitely my fault. But even even still, the, even the taking out you know, uh, the things that were really my fault, I don't feel so bad about it because really – you know, it was it's just super stressful uh, when you can't run your nav lights. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, so for me to come in just to have that problem solved yeah. and to know what it was uh, was really good. And also to have the problem of the, um, you know, of the, the wind generator solved was really good because when I got here, I had to ring the, the guys up from Stella and say, you know, look, this, you know, this uh, – Wind generator's blown up again, and now this is the second wind generator and the third wind, third regulator for the wind generators I've blown up in like three weeks. Mm. So, you know, I was expecting them to say, "Well, what are you doing to these wind generators?" You know, like you, <laughs> you know, but they weren't. They were really good, and they just, even though they hadn't had any problems with any of the other ones, it was just, you know, um, it was when they started to break and this diode wasn't working properly. Yeah, that's when the, when the problems sort of came and, and uh, so anyway, so uh, they've done a general recall on all those wind generators. So it makes me feel a bit better that, you know, okay, that wasn't really. Well, this, yeah, there's, a, there's, there's only so much you can do with preparation, right? But you, you do put a lot of faith in contractors and, and product suppliers and like you yeah, said, you've already gone through the yeah. replacement process and before leaving. Paul Harold, my, my uh, you know, my electrician, you know, because this was, you know, because the first, the first thing is, oh, it hasn't been installed properly, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he he came down from the Gold Coast free of charge, um, you know. He's, he's been fantastic, but he was really concerned because he'd done a really good job with all the installations. Mm. But you know, at the end of the day, it was just you know, that's just. But I mean, the best thing about it is, is that it happened, uh, um, you know, between the Gold Coast and Sydney. Uh, so it really hasn't changed a lot. Yeah. Uh, and what it boils, you know, what it brings back home is that, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was sort of getting the boat ready and, you know, involved with, you know, just sort of family and, you know, my, you know, my first grandchild and all that kind of stuff before I left. 
Mm. And I really didn't think I had I really didn't think I had the the, the time and the space uh, to go for a you know a long shakedown cruise. Uh-huh. Uh, just to check all this this sort of stuff out. Yeah. This all would have become apparent. Yeah. Um, you know, for you know, like on a two day cruise. Um, so it just goes to show that's what I should have done. Yeah. Uh, and in the end, that's what I did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So. We just had a nice shakedown cruise from uh, the Gold Coast to Sydney. I'm really disappointed, you know, because the Southport Yacht Club is so great. Yeah. Uh, that I won't be finishing at Southport. Uh, I'll be finishing at Sydney now. So that's a, uh, you know, that's a that's a disappointment for me because I um I really wanted to um I really wanted to bring that record home to the Southport Yacht Club, mm-hmm. which I still will do. But yeah, you know, I'll be finishing in Sydney, which is uh, um you know it's a beautiful place to sail into, but it's not. Uh, home, so well, you'll, yeah. you'll have a, you'll be able to sail into Sydney and finish, and you'll be able to sail into the Gold Coast and finish again. Um, yeah, yeah. So I you, don't still, know you can still have two finishes, even though one will be official and one will be un- unofficial. But in terms of so, a couple of questions around that: Was it easy to update your westbound, non-stop, unassisted circumnavigation attempt and change it from Sydney to Gold Coast, given you'd already started oh. and departed? Was it easy to do? Was it expensive to do? Yeah, so yeah, so it's eight hundred pounds. Whoa! <laughs> Just to do it like slight variation. Yeah, to restart. Whoa! Okay. Yeah, so to restart sixteen hundred pounds to 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 register for a record attempt. Yeah. And then to restart, it's eight hundred pounds. So or you're, you're supposed to feel pounds, good about a fifty percent discount, are you? Is that is that the strategy? <laughs> Sorry. You're supposed to feel good about having a fifty percent discount. Is that the strategy when they price it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. <laughs> Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate yeah. that. So, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. And so, but it's uh, it's um, and it's an, it's an easy uh, path to. So basically, instead of going to the Canaries, yeah, I go to the Azores. You go around the Azores, uh-huh. um, and uh, and then the uh, track's just the same. Okay. Um, the um, I'm going to be a bit later uh, going around Cape Horn, mm-hmm. uh, but. Um, you know, it's 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 never you know. There's never a time when you can say, "Oh, this is a great time to go around Cape Horn." Except February, they say is probably the best time. Yeah. But you know, people I've spoken to said sometimes the summer storms are more intense than the winter storms. Anyway, they're not as frequent. So okay. So what will your timing be then? Do you think? At the stage uh, Cape well, Horn? I think you know it probably will be around April. Yeah, mm-hmm. that I get to Cape Horn. So yeah, uh, so it will be you know. Uh, uh, more into more, there'll be more frequent um, uh, storms mm-hmm. uh, or low pressure systems coming through. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, basically, you know, I can just uh, you know heave to for a little while in the in the lee there of uh, South America and wait for a um, wait for a window to get through there. Yeah. Um, so and uh, that's what that's what I'll do. So and and uh, like a lot of people have said to me, you know, they've been around in winter and 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 uh, I've spoken to a lot of people. Who've, uh, who've been around Cape Horn in the uh, in the last few weeks, and yeah. some have been around in winter, and some have been around in summer. Yeah. Um, some have been, you know, one guy said to me, you know, Bill Gleason, uh, who's been around Cape Horn a couple of times, said he's never Cape Horn has never never thrown up the challenges that the Tasman Sea has. So, wow, well, that's interesting. Know, so he's had his worst experiences there. So wow. you know. Okay. So. You know, so we'll just basically, um, yeah, just take 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 it as it comes. Yeah. You know, the boat boat felt great in, in you know 40, 45 knots. It was really nice. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I haven't had it out in fifties and sixties yet, but you know, in forty fives, it was uh, with the you know, I still had another reef to go mm-hmm. in the in the mainsail. Mm-hmm. I was just under two reefs on the main and uh, and and the storm jib, and uh, it just felt really comfortable. So going to windward, well, slow. That's good. You know, I was doing about three knots, three and a half knots to windward, but uh, very comfortable in, mm-hmm. in 45 knots, yeah. So it was good. That's good. And, I mean, it has been fortunate that you were going down the coast and not going the easterly route straight across the Tasman, um, you know, I guess. Yeah, that would, you know, that would have been really hard. Well, I mean, you could restart from Auckland or something like that, but... Yeah, you know, or you might have had to return to, to the... The Gold Coast, so at least you were coastal. I guess it's just a it just reinforces to anybody doing a 
a, a, a big refit and a big upgrade before a big voyage, you know, to do a couple of shakedown sales and don't just do them in five or 10 knots, go and do them in 35, 40 knots like, like you ended up doing because that's yeah. where everything really gets tested and that's where, <laughs> that's where you get tested as well, right? Trying to, trying to tame the beast when things start coming unstuck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's, um, and sometimes, you know, especially where we live, it's, just, you know, it's not that easy to get out there in 35 minutes. No, because no. we don't actually see it that often, do we? we no. See, and then you when know. you do see it, you've got to be able to get out through the seaway. That's the hard part, right? So you can get out into it. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, a lot of time it just would be foolhardy, wouldn't it? If it yeah. was 35 knots yeah. and a big swell, it would be just foolhardy to try and get out there. So it is tricky on the Gold Coast here to, sort of, uh, to get that kind of uh, weather. But... Definitely, if you sort of head out and you, uh, you know, basically plan a five-day or a six-day cruise, I guess, in the Tasman, you'd probably come across, you know, a couple of systems that would have a big yeah. punch to them. Yeah, you go there long enough. You go far enough out. Um, so just a couple of questions, Andy. I mean, it's um, as you were heading south and, you know, you left, uh, I think, early, early October or around the, around the 7th or 8th or something, was it, of October? Eighth, yeah, eight. So heading south and you've got tailwinds and it's... It's all it's all going nicely, and you're off into you know the big the big voyage, and then the wind rose goes round on the nose, and then that goes okay, and then and then you know with some of your electrical issues and your particularly your Genoa issue, things start to unravel a bit. What was your what, what looking back? What what were your sort of initial kind of um, feelings or instincts at that time? Do, you know, do you think I can deal with this, or did you think, but well, yeah, what the hell's going on? This isn't supposed to happen, or did, did you think I've had a guts full of this? It's not supposed to be like this, and you know. <laughs> What, what, what are the thoughts that went through your mind? Well, you know, I could, uh, um, you know, I was, you know, on the floor deck, you know, trying to tame that head sail, and I was mm. like, the and I was like, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> you know, and and thinking, you know, you know, if I fall in, like that's it, you know, like it's going to be really. Um, hard to get back on the boat. Mm. Even though the soil wasn't that big, it was still, you know, it was still, you know, and I just remember thinking, Jesus, what am I doing here? But, you know, uh, eventually I sort of tied the whole thing up into a kind of a nice, neat tea, you know. So I looked at it and I thought, oh, well, oh, that's really great. I was really proud of myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, he's like, I've got this under control. I've got this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I thought, you know, oh, well, that's, you know, that was a, you know, was a real, um, that was really, you know, good to be able to sort of minimise the damage and, and get the boat back on an even track and, mm-hmm. you know, and get sailing again after, after it actually, um, you know, all, all sort of been so, um, you know, basically just turned to, to absolute crap in front of my eyes. Mm. But um, so that was good. And, but it, it was, I definitely thought at, uh, you know, when I was out there in, in the dark and it was, it was, you know, you know, it's different, isn't it? You know, like when mm. you're by yourself, you Absolutely. sort of, you just, you sort of can't say to someone else, what do you reckon about this? You know, like, what are we going to do? Uh, you know, you just buy yourself, and so for you know, um, and and you know, I was, at that point I was about 150 miles offshore, and um, and uh, I thought, wow, this is um, you know, this is a uh, you know intense, mm. and uh, and I really did sort of think I'd rather not be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> On the floor. Yeah. Out of helicopter you know? range and <laughs> along uh, can help. So, so that was, uh, yeah, uh, you know, it, that was really like a, um, it was sort of like a half an hour of, wow, you know, what, you know, you really, you, you know, I really thought, shit, I'm really in the middle of this. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I just basically, well, I was scared for a little while. And mm. I was sort of, you know, Basically, you know, you sort of, you know, you get a bit of a wave hit there on the side of the boat, you know, and, and throws the nose around and you're hanging on to the, you know, the, the head saw and, you, you know, you're sort of thinking, Jesus, like, mm. like you know, like the boat didn't get knocked flat right now, I'd be lying in the water, you know. Mm. And because uh, it was, uh, and the noise of the, you know, it all adds up, doesn't it? You know, the noise yeah. of the wind and the noise of the... The noise is going crazy, and yeah. sort of, and the spray, yeah. the spray sting in your eyes, and the noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> and then the noise of the sail flogging, which is just stressful at a few different levels. Oh, it's stressful because you, you, go, you keep, you know, like you're sort of going, I've got to stop it flogging, you know? Yeah. And um, uh, so that was good. But, uh, you know, uh, the only thing that worked really was the flaming wind rain. That was the thing that really worked well. Um, the uh, the, um, the Raymarine, I, I, I have a, a, a Raymarine um, uh, ST4000 which is a Sea Talk uh, product, and I have a Sea Talk to Sea Talk NG converter uh-huh. for for the chart plot and everything like that. But the converter is always uh, it's always been unstable, and so <clears throat> at one point there, you know, the compass just lost all its calibration, so it was like thirty degrees out, and uh, this is yeah. while all this was happening. Gosh, and uh, and uh, so it took me about an hour to figure that out. Um, and uh, so that's another thing I've done. I've gone, okay, well, that's just, you know, stupid. So I've upgraded to a, um, an Evo so that everything's C talk NG, mm-hmm. so that well, I don't need to rely on that converter. It's because it's never been good. Like, I've always had to turn everything on in a sequence. Otherwise, you know, every, it just gets rubbish sentences getting sent across the network. So, uh-huh. um, so yeah, so I've done that as well. One of the things I've done is change the change the autopilot uh, to a to a um, an Evo uh, the latest that's compatible with all the instruments and chart plotter. So mm-hmm. and the uh, uh, compass gives a true heading all the time, which is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. So so based on what's happened, is it does, has it sort of heightened your family's concerns about? The type of stuff that can happen, or have they, or have they also got confidence in the fact you've dealt with a whole bunch of stuff and that you didn't expect to have to deal with, and you know now you're going to be a little bit more bulletproof second time around. Yeah, uh, both. Yeah. So um, one of the worst things that happened is that uh, before I left, I um, I uh, had a, a, a EPO that came with the boat and. It was out of date and quite old, probably about nine or ten years old. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I'm not going to take this with me because it might just malfunction and go off automatically and, you know, mm-hmm. cause everyone a whole lot of stress at home when there's nothing wrong. So um, I went to throw it in the bin and then, you know, before I threw it in the bin, I saw, oh, um, don't throw it in the bin. And I thought, of course not. So I didn't throw it in the bin. But then I, I just left it in this little car I'd been using. Uh, you might see it, that little uh, Citroen that I had just as basically as a tool shed for the boat. Mm-hmm. And I got rid of that just before I left. But one of the things I forgot was that the uh, that EPIRB was still in the car. Right. And uh, so on the third day, uh, my wife gets a call saying, um, is an EPIRB registered oh, to your... Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, to your, uh, to your, uh, you know, to your, you're the nominated person, and it's gone off, and you know, and um, and they couldn't give her any more information except that the EPIRB had gone off, and my oh, poor wife Debbie, she was, she was, she had an hour and a half of just like hell, um, and I couldn't have my sat phone on all the time because it was chewing up too much power, so she couldn't call me, uh-huh. um, and uh, and. Um, the, uh, at that time, just around that time, was uh, also when the uh, um, the uh, I had the problem with the Genoa, yeah. so uh, with the furler. So I had to. I was basically um, heading heading back in a in a northerly direction, having the uh, the uh, mainsail shadow the Genoa uh-huh. um, to stop it flogging so much, and. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, it was not very good. So about an hour and a half later, they rang her and said, it's gone off in uh, Ormo, which is uh, <laughs> <laughs> Gold Coast. He's run really, really badly at ground. They've gone 10 kilometres inland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and she said, no, that can't be right because he's in the middle of the ocean. So that was good. So she was able to, um, uh, you know, Sort of calm down again, but 
apparently she said she was at work and in her office mm. and she got the call and then she just shut the door and said, just nobody come into my office. Mm. And uh, so she sat there for an hour and a half. You know, oh, so. thing. that's pretty distressing. Yeah, I know. It is, really. And and really, I should have just kept it on the boat. Uh, yeah. Because it couldn't, couldn't have got any worse <laughs> than actually it turned out to be. So anyway, poor old Debbie. That's just one, another uh, item in a long list of grievances she could have against me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, she's great. Uh, yeah. Okay. So... She's forgiven me, so it didn't take a long. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and um, so with your, how many how many amps do you hold on the boat when your batteries are full? Four hundred. Yeah, so right. I've got two, I've got three one hundred amp hour batteries as house batteries, mm-hmm. and another battery exactly the same as a start battery. So I can put them all together and have four hundred of house. Yeah, I really don't need a start battery. Uh, separate because um, the engine cranks uh, really easily by hand. Uh-huh. So if I had no power and needed to crank the engine, it only takes about you know twenty or thirty seconds to crank her up, and away she goes. It's very easy to to hand start. Okay, and so so using <coughs> twenty amps a night is quite a quite a, oh, 20 a, a decent night, chunk. Especially, yeah, especially well, the problem is yeah yeah if, if you end up somewhere where you're getting not a lot of charge either by wind or solar, then you can't afford to just have that that kind of drain going on no and and, and and not only was i drawing 20 amps a night but i had no wind uh and only one spare solar panel so i was only able to put and it was cloudy yeah uh so i was only able to put about like seven to ten amps back in during the day maybe mm. 12 mm-hmm. so Did i was actually you know living in negative to run the motor and uh and I was really, you know, I was thinking I can't do this, you know, because mm. I haven't got enough fuel to run the motor every day. Yeah. So, um, so in the end, it was, uh, you know, yeah, but twenty amps is a lot, you know. Like basically, yeah. it's, you know, if you got three hundred amp or three hundred amp hours in my house batteries, really, you can probably only really draw. You know, you wouldn't like to draw more than a hundred out of that, would you? No, I mean. So, Rule of thumb, you, you want to try and keep them above 80%, don't you? Which really yeah. gets you down yeah. to, what, um, 60 amps. So, yeah, losing 20 out of 60 is quite a big percentage to keep it in yeah. context. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, now, uh, you know, I, um, I, leave, I leave everything running all night. And uh, I've got full batteries by 9 o'clock in the morning. So, so that's... Uh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it won't be like that once I get out there. But it's been no. the same, yeah. Well, yeah. I've um, I put up the solar on just before the the Sydney Gold Coast race, and I thought, oh yeah, that'd be great. Um, it'll top my batteries up, but but it, they didn't actually. They they steadily ran down over the four days. But what I found in summer, the, they you know, I can run all the refrigeration now, and even with and with solar on, it's still putting amps in. So even the difference between this, the winter sun and the sun, summer sun must be it must be three times the strength in terms of what I've seen it do amps-wise. So that's another factor you've got as well, depending on what season you're in. Uh, yeah. Not, yeah. not just the fact that it's direct sun, but the strength of the sun, it is quite a big difference between summer and winter. Yeah. yeah. It, well, that's right. I, look, I don't really know a lot about solar panels, and uh, I've been learning a lot, but, you know, it's, uh, it's a very... Um, it's, it's, there's a lot to it, isn't there? Yeah, I, I don't know a lot yeah. either. It's, it's, I just assume you put them on and away you go, but there's yeah, there's a bit more to them than that in terms mm. of strength of sun and direct sun and angle of sun and overcast versus yeah. sunny. Um, yeah, so my theory now is like you have like heaps more than you need. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've got a couple that are portable, so I can I can just put them in the direct sun mm-hmm. so that they're unshaded. That's a good idea. And, uh, and, uh, and then... The regulators are the weak point, mm-hmm. as far as I can make out. Mm-hmm. And, um, so you have, you know, you have lots of redundancy in your regulators. That's that's been my take out from all this. Yeah. You know, okay. You know. And so tell me about your food and the repacking you've had to do there. Oh what, yeah, what that? disaster that was. Yeah. So, um, so basically, we we packed all the food in uh, in tuna bags, double bagged them. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and then put them in um, 
plastic garbage bags over the top of that just to give them sort of some protection. Yeah. Um, now, the, but the, the problem with that was is that the plastic garbage bags, because they weren't tight, they have all these folds and they hold all the moisture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it gets very – where they're packed away inside like uh, little compartments inside the boat, it gets very moist inside there. Right. And the other thing that was happening with the garbage bags, because that plastic is so hard um, and the constant movement, it actually started to and, – and the dampness started to wear away at the varnish coatings on the um, – on, the, on all the uh, compartments in the in the four deck area in the, in the four peak area. That's amazing, isn't it? It's such a short period of time. Yeah, I know. And it, when I, when when I sort of came in, I went, oh, I'm just going to repack all this food, and um, and I started pulling it out, and it was all damp, you know, and uh, uh, and also where it was, you could see it just had worn through the varnish, mm-hmm. and. Um, so it was really, you know, the, so anyone contemplating using a garbage bag for anything other than garbage, you know, I can just <laughs> tell you, like, it's very good for putting garbage in, but, you know, not, uh, it's not good for anything else, I don't think. So the, the garbage bags were just a, you know, a, a sort of a, an idea that I had, which was just, just a really bad idea. Yeah. And I just, um, so, uh, so I had to I basically re um, I've just used uh, some um, epoxy and re epoxied the uh, and sealed all that uh, that four peak area. Mm-hmm. Uh, and luckily, uh, you know, uh, Whitworth, which is a local or Australia wide chain of um, of chandlery shops, had a, a special on sixty liter uh, dry bags, uh-huh. um, twenty four dollars each. So I bought like twenty five of those. And uh, and all the food now is in these sixty litre dry bags, which is just um, you know so much better. Uh-huh. It's much the material's much softer. Uh-huh. They're they're full and tight. And there's they don't con- they don't cause condensation, and uh, and it's all packed away really nicely. So I'm really happy about that. But that would have been one of those things, you know. The uh, so some of the um, some of the bags that, that got wet from you know where the uh, where they're in supposedly watertight compartments that that uh, that uh, that leaked due to the time of the Genoa to them. Yeah. Um, the uh, you know I had to throw that food away, and you sort of think like, wow. Uh, oh, so you I, actually I, I didn't, I didn't food, really have food. to throw it away, but I did. You know. Because of the damage. Just, oh, it's a bit wet. That's it. Cans yeah. and all. You know. That could have been, <laughs> a, that could have been a headache <laughs> in, a, in a three or four months' time. Yeah, well, that's right. Like it, it could have turned into, you know, a real, a real problem um, because the, you know, the the timber underneath the garbage bags never dried and never would have dried, right? Because it, it and so it would have worn through the um, worn through the the, the uh, varnish that was on top of them, and then it would have started to. You know, grow fungus and mold, mold. And damp, and such a yeah. Wow. So, so yeah. So the garbage bags are all gone. There's not one left on the boat. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I've repacked the boat now. I think it's the fourth time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm really happy with it now. It's all repacked so that each each one of those 25 bags I can actually take out without affecting all the others that are all stowed nice and tight. And mm-hmm. So yeah. So you know that. That probably I, I spent, you know, before I left, I spent, you know, about six hours packing the boat. It's pretty food. fast. Yeah, and then I spent like when I've been down here, I spent four days, mm. and in during that four days, I've thought, you know, that really, you know. I'm going to spend another day. So it might be five days mm-hmm. packing the boat. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe more, might even be six, just in, in packing everything into the boat. And that's what I should have done, you know, because it's just so, um, so much. It's, it's such a pleasure to do it properly. Yeah. And, and know that that's going to last the whole journey. And, uh, you know, so, but uh, yeah, so again, that was another thing. I'll just probably rush towards the end. Yeah. 
you know, we just ran out of a little bit of time. Mm-hmm. You know, we we had I had different priorities, you know, with a new new grandchild and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. we sort of tried to push it all in and and get well, it done. Yeah, it's, and the other challenge you have, I guess, which is like a challenge to sort of, I guess, take on sometimes without realizing. But when you've got a a leaving ceremony and people coming to see you off and all that kind of stuff. I yeah, guess that, you can't that lays, say, oh, sorry, that lays another whole level of pressure on, right? Because if you if you need to change your plans, you're really torn between <laughs> obligations to others and yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, it's so true. Yeah, I was speaking to you know, Mike Saban, who's this great sail maker, and he was travelling around the world. And he said uh, he was leaving from England, and um, he'd been over there working, and um, he he said people kept asking him. When are you leaving? Because he said, "Oh, we're going soon," and blah 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 blah. And so there's a whole lot of people, friends, and yeah. people in the industry, and they all said to him, "You know, they all kept asking him when are you leaving." And he said, uh, "His answer was, one day when you look out there and the boat's not there, that means we've left." <laughs> <laughs> when we're ready, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, so that's it. So I mean, you know. A lot of people do it. Oh, the guys, the one day globe boats, one day globe boats, and all those guys who have left now. I mean, they've got no choice. They've got to be ready yeah. by the day. Um, but you know, we're, with us, we now. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to be leaving. Uh, you know, not this week, but uh, sometime in, during next week. But mm-hmm. really, I'm leaving when every single job on the list is done. Yeah, and and the boats, you know, where I want it to be. Uh, so you know, um, luckily for me, I don't have to beat uh, Bill Hatfield anymore. He's uh, he's pulled out in Albany, so basically, I can just you know make sure I can get around um, with as few problems as possible now. So yeah, that's what we're doing. And, and why did he pull out? You know, he had a similar problem with his uh, furler. Um, but he, he did, you know, he had quite a, quite a, he did cop a, a fair bit of wind. The same system that uh, I got in um, on the uh, way down, yeah, he got in the Great Australian Bite, so he caught a little bit more than me. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, so the boat did cop a bit of a hammering. His boat, mm-hmm. um, he lost his Dodger, and then he lost his. Wow. Uh, that's it's a, it's a little bit sketchy. I don't know all the details, but I do know that he was uh, lying a hole for quite a few days. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know the boat did did suffer a bit of damage. Um, so and that's I guess that's the thing too. You know, everyone talks about you know the, all the problems you can you can encounter around the place, but you know just getting around Australia can be a bit of a challenge sometimes. Mm. Right? Just, it's a really just good point. That. Yeah. You don't have to be up in the middle of the ocean to encounter really, really tough weather. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, so he he he's uh he had to motor back into Albany, which um means that he he's basically said he's not going to try again till next year. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a piece of bonus for you. Well, um, you know, I was always hoping that would happen to him, but I just didn't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There's always a secret hope. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's easier. The race is always easier if the competitors fall out of it. That's for sure. That's exactly right. Yeah. I'll be the Stephen Bradbury of uh, Ocean Sailing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Um, you've already got enough material to probably fill up the first six chapters of a book anyway, so you're on the right track. <laughs> Um, yeah. So I I read that you were getting some mainsail alterations done, and you got lifelines and a, some staunchness to replace as well. Tell me, tell me mm-hmm. about those. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, interestingly, Alan um, Nabal uh, dropped down to see me, mm-hmm. uh, and Alan's responsible for the one day glow boats in the southern hemisphere. Um, and uh, so he's got a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said to he looked at the slides to the main solids and he said, um, "Oh, you happy with those slides?" And I said, "Yeah, no, but I, I'm, um, you know, I'm always a bit sus. So I've got all these other spare ones which are really, really good slides and they're, they're bulletproof, so if they break or 
yeah. something goes wrong with them. I've got these other really good ones to put onto them. And then he looked at me and he said, um, why don't you put the good ones on now and have the other ones as spares? And that was like a light bulb moment. It was just like so obvious. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, oh, yeah, that's a really good idea. So I, I, um, I, I uh, just immediately took the mainsail off. I said, help me take the mainsail off. And I took it down to the sailmakers and um, they, were, they were putting the really heavy-duty slides on it. Yeah. I mean, the slides on it. You know, I, I thought that would be all right, you know, but, um, yeah, what a, what a backwards way of thinking of... of well, you know, yeah. Um, you other, know, it's other just other like... slide problems and, if, yeah, if, if, the, if, if one goes and you're in a big blow and then the yeah, next that's what he said. two or three said, go, well, if they do go, you, you have a repair that you know it with it, yeah, attached to the top and bottom and f- shaking itself <laughs> to pieces, so... <laughs> yeah, yet another yeah. beast to get under control in high winds. Um, so yeah, starting off with your strongest uh, slides on there probably makes a lot of sense. I know, and, and when when he said it, I was like, yeah, I was just so amazed at myself that like of the thought process that I had about them. Mm. I had, had this thought process that you know I wasn't really you know confident in them, so I was going to take these spares, which I ordered specially. Um, and uh, you know, and so they were there, and and my whole idea was that you know, like I was going to change them in the middle of the ocean. Right? Yeah, uh, so uh, there, your thinking was, oh, well, at least when I have a problem, I can fix it, as opposed to maybe I should just try and avoid the problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So I mean, that was just uh, you know, I mean, it's it's pretty embarrassing when you look back on it. You think, geez, well. You know, it's not that you don't have to be that smart to figure that out, but sometimes no. it's just like not seeing the trees for the forest or well, the forest for and the trees. When you're working for your list of 200 things to do, and it's another thing that you can just park till later, and you know, if and when you need to, it just it starts to happen, right? Because when, you, when you're just trying to get to the start line, you, yeah, yeah, exactly. Just, you you're, too, just, you're trying to simplify things, but you're actually not, you're actually complicating them by trying to simplify them, yeah. You know, you're trying to sort of, you know, it's exactly right. Just trying to, I don't need to, I don't really need to do that. So I'll, I'll just have a backup plan. But yeah, but yeah so, um, and, and, and again, it's again, you know, like, uh, it's the other thing is, is, um, you know, having, having people just come down who, you know, who, who've got a lot of experience and have got a, enough confidence, um, to say something to you. Yeah. You know? Um, so a lot of people might have looked at that already. And gone, uh, but sort of not said anything because they don't want to um, defend you, or they yeah. don't want to, you know, whatever. I don't know. Yeah, but, well, uh, when you're when you're hungry for that advice from experienced people, and they're not receiving, it doesn't really help you, does it? Um, so it's, yeah, but it's yeah. Good. but to be fair, you're pretty you're a pretty open guy, and you're pretty open to receiving feedback too. So that that helps, I'm sure. Um, some people aren't that open to feedback um, of a constructive nature. Yeah. Well, you know. Like I, you know, it's not as a, you know, it's not as a, like I've got a lot, you know, there's a lot of people out there with a lot of information that can actually make life easier for you. So it's, uh, it's worth, worth listening when you can, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And then, then last year I saw a note there about installing a red port optimizer. What, what does that do? Oh well, um, so I've just installed that, and I'm, uh, I'm actually working on it today. So. Um, my internet bill was like quite high, uh, and um, so this optimizer is basically it's a it's a firewall. But normally our firewalls are inside our computers, and you know we do that. Whereas this is a um, this is an external device which contains a, a, some kind of firewall inside the device. Yeah, and it's also a wireless hub, and so basically. What it does is it strips everything uh, out of all your emails and it strips everything out of, you know, basically um, if you want to browse the internet, you get another add-on or plug into it. Or, mm-hmm. and you can, so basically, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, using kilobytes of data rather than yeah, right. gigabytes or megabytes. Yeah, um, right. So all the graphics are stripped out, all the, you know, uh, Ads sort of stripped out, all the updates uh, are blocked, and um, so because it's um, you know 
I, I, I used over a thousand dollars worth of data on the way from Sydney to to the Gold, from the Gold Coast to Sydney. So goodness me, you know, yeah, and um, and you you can you can lose, use a lot. So I mean, I was always going to use a bit more in the first stages, just setting things up. But when I saw the because I pay seven dollars fifty a megabyte. Yeah, right. Um, I and mean, there's so much in, in, in all the graphics these days. And all the animation and all the images, there's a lot of there's a lot of megabytes in there. Yeah, that's right. So, so yeah, so so, um, and then basically, you sort of stuff sneaks through as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, so you think you've got everything firewalled, and then you know something else that you didn't think of sneaks through, and sort of while you're just sort of checking your emails, you download like, you know. Six six megabytes of just updates to some yeah like, program that you got on your computer that you never use. Yeah, so. lazy, lazy old forty five dollars for um thirty seconds uh, enjoyment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so hopefully, you know, this red port optimizer. Uh, you know, I heard great reports about it, and uh, it's just a very solid, strong firewall that that, that keeps your internet um build really down. And if you want to send photos, apparently you can send them. Two in really really small um, uh, formats, uh -huh. smaller formats than you could basically just using your your uh, your um, programs on your computer to cool. sort of reduce the size. So oh, that's great. Yeah, so hope, well, well, hopefully that'll work. So I'll be able to um, uh, do some because one of the things I was trying to do was just do some updates. Yeah. Uh, on the way down, but uh, you know it, it, the internet. It's not so fast, so every time I tried to connect to the website, it's you know it fell out and all yeah. that stuff. So, uh, so we'd probably have a better, um, a better uh, update uh, program in place uh, mm -hmm. when we leave. So, so I'm working on that at the moment. So, and what's your goal with good. updating your blog at andylamont.com.au? What's your sort of what are you aiming to do frequency wise at this stage? Assuming all weather is good and everything else is good. Yeah. Well. Um, what I'm trying to do is uh, work out a way in a similar way that you're doing now with Skype uh, is just uh, do a voice update uh -huh. uh, daily. Um, That's a good idea. And, yeah. Because the voice is, is 70 cents a minute. Oh, right. So, and you can, yeah, you can, you can do way more quicker too with voice. I mean, you can speak at a couple of hundred words a minute versus trying to hand write everything. Yeah, exactly. And... Um, you know, so if I do, you know, a five or five-minute voice update every day, that's, yeah. um, you know, that's, Jesus, it's only less than $5. It's yeah. like $4. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the, the um, trying to trying to get the internet uh, uh, working, it's just expensive. So yeah. um, so that's what I'm trying to work out at the moment. Uh, okay. I'm trying, trying to um, do basically what you're doing with Skype here now, recording. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you're using a you're not recording on Skype, are you at the moment? Uh, I'm using a program called Call Recorder, which cool, um, cool. you can connect to Skype or you can connect to FaceTime on Macs as well. But Call Recorder is a separate software program. I think it's like twenty nine dollars or thirty nine dollars, and you just yeah. it automatically yeah. opens with Skype and then just hits you just hit record. Um, oh, okay. And then it just records yeah. and saves it to a, a predetermined file on your on your computer. Yeah, so that's what I want to do. I might even talk to you about doing that. Might yeah, sure. You. Your Skype number or something, and yep, yep, get you recorded. Yeah, I can help you with but, that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, so that's what I'd like to do. Uh, I'd like to just do daily updates. You know, five minutes, uh, which is um, you know, some days out there when there's nothing's happening, well, might struggle to fill five minutes, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, might be interesting. Or you know, so that's 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 the plan I'd like to try. Yeah. Well, that'd be great. And hearing your voice yeah. is, is cool, and hearing your state of mind and you know the ups and downs and everything else that goes with it that, that, that helps bring it all to life really i think rather than just reading words on a page yeah 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 um, so yeah hopefully that'll work okay and when so at this stage um what, what what have you got left to 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 do before you can think about departing where, where, where are you kind of at now um so i'm basically um I've repacked the front of the boat. Uh, I'm going to repack the, the whole of the boat to uh, right through, take, taking everything out and, and repacking it all. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm uh, in the middle of uh, just uh, replacing some staunchions. Um, I'm redoing my reefing system. Um, uh, and um, what else do I have to do? Oh, I've just got a basically, uh, I, haven't got, I haven't got my list here with me, but um, but there's quite a few things I'm just doing. Um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, I'm waiting. I'm waiting on a few bits and pieces. Um, just uh, I've got the guys from Course Master. I want to get them out just to have a look at my Course Master pilot as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so that's happening uh, next week. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a. Uh, Jeez, now I've been drawn a mental blank. That's all right. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. And will you be, will you need to go um, and do any more road road testing or shakedown stuff before you actually read the parts, yeah, Sydney? Yeah, I'm gonna go for a sale. Uh, probably uh, during next week. Um, just to make sure it's all sort of working. Mm-hmm. Um, the, um, so yeah, so I should be I should be ready to go. Um, hopefully I'm thinking uh, not next week but early the week after. So, okay. Good. Yeah. So, and, uh, yeah, that should be yep. pretty much cool. ready then. Oh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to service all my witches again mm-hmm. just before I go as well. That's mm-hmm. another thing. I thought oh, I'll do that because I did it, I did it a little while ago. I thought, well, they're done. But, you know, having having spoken to uh, to Alan, you know, and, and applying that principle to the uh, – of the sail uh, sliders to everything else on the boat, I may as well service the witches now while I'm sitting in a marina yeah. rather than doing it. And, you know, I can yeah. go buy a spare part if I need to. So, yeah. um, not that they needed. I serviced them about three months ago, but I thought, oh, well, you know, I spoke to someone who services his witches every six months. Mm. I don't know when was the last time you serviced yours. Oh, mine, mine was serviced maybe two years ago. <laughs> That's what I thought. And I do about eighty races a year, so they get a bit of use. Yeah, but it's probably not best practice. (laughs) Yeah, I was speaking with Shane um, Kearns, who's got the beautiful little SNS thirty four, which is the complete opposite to my boat, where it's completely empty, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and just a real real racing machine. And he services his witches every six months. Yeah, right. Uh, Yeah. So, wow. I thought, geez. That's a bit of a wake-up call. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in your case, you might, depending on how often you, you know, tack in bits and pieces, you might not actually overuse your winches, given you might be on the same tack for days on end two at times. So. Yeah, but that's good, true too. Good yeah. to know they're done though. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I thought. Well, I'll do it while I'm here. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. So basically everything I can think of, you know, I, I, um, I, had, a, I had a bit of uh, algae in my fuel and I just got a... Um, I just I rang up the fuel doctor and they said you know you put this all this additives through and that'll fix it. But then while I was here, I just thought I'll oh, you know I had just had the whole tank cleaned out and mm-hmm. all the diesel thrown away and the new diesel put in and polished and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Just the, the little things that can sort of trip you up if you don't you know yeah. if you if you sort of leave them. So that's great. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're going to be uh, and and. In better shape than ever by the time you uh you uh, leave the next uh, week or so. <laughs> yeah, that's the plan. And your live that's tracker cool. on your website's working, so people can follow your track <laughs> around the world. It's it's uh it's working and showing you parked at the CYCA right now. But so that's if you go to Andy's website, andylamont.com.au, and to the live tracker page, uh, that that will obviously be working as you uh, head off again. Yeah, that seemed to work really well. That was one thing that. So there's a couple of things that worked. That worked. <laughs> the, um, the Fleming wind rain worked and the uh, course master or our pilot worked yeah but uh, you know um, and the uh, it was great to have that little storm jib too uh, you know set on the furler inside the mast it was just you know what a uh, such a pleasure you know like just to be able to when the when the head saw furler was working or the Genoa furler was working yeah. to fill up the Genoa and just Unfilled the storm jib. It was just so easy. So easy to change yeah. gears. That's that's nice. Yeah, to be up the floor yeah. And do that. Yeah. So that worked pretty well. But yeah. Okay. And so, um, I was just questioning. I was going to ask you before your 
Fleming Windvane, have you got a have you given it a, a pet name already or a nickname or something? What do you, what do you call it? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> yeah, like Not yet. Um, Wilson or something like that, you know. Um, you, know. you need to do that at some point so you can have a conversation with somebody on a daily basis. Oh, no, I know. No, no I was try, I'm trying to avoid that <laughs> <laughs> for as long as possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that's excellent, Andy. Um, thanks for thanks for agreeing to catch up this morning. I know you've got a lot that you're working through, so putting aside it now, I really, really appreciate that. And I've had, I have had lots of people at the club um, asking about you and, and also and also emails from listeners all over the place asking about you. So I just thought it was just a good opportunity to uh, have a chat and um, give everybody an update. And, um, and it, it, to me, everyone at the club just, just wants you to sail safely around the world and return um, at the other end. So that I don't think anyone's overly concerned about stopping and uh, having to fix a few things because we've all been in that position um, doing far, far lesser challenges than what you're doing. So, you know, good on you for having this seamanship to do that and, and park everything while you did it rather than pushing on, you know, blindly um, and probably coming unstuck later on. Yeah, well, thanks. It was a, yeah, it was a tough decision, but I, I, I think it was the right one. Yeah. Definitely. No doubt about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, so it would be good. So, I, um, well, I miss all the, 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 the camaraderie at the, at the club. It was, uh, it was, it was, Great fun to every Thursday to go sailing there. So um, can't wait to get back, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. That'd so be um, it'd, it'd be great. And, uh, um, yep, I'll, uh, I'll probably have a little bit more time now to, um, to make sure I sort of make some more updates on the uh, on the website. Yep, that'd be great. And, uh, yeah, so thanks for talking to me. And, um Good luck this this season, mate. How you going? You winning all the races again? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I better not comment on that. I might have a few people get upset with me, but um, it's fair to say that that um, Russell, Russell and I are seeing, I think first equal in the Twilight series at the moment after nine uh, races. So, uh, so we've taken your place. Uh, sorry about that, but um, <laughs> sorry to do it, so. you're going to need what? You're going to have to get another big uh, shelf to put all the trophies on. Uh, or? <laughs> <You won't. laughs> I don't know, if we won't go there, but uh, we might have seen a couple of people. But no, it's all good fun. It's all good fun. So, uh, it, is. it is. Okay. All right. You take all care. Right. We'll talk, to, talk soon. See you okay. then. Thanks, Andy. See you. Bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to david at oceansailingpodcast.com.au. See you next week. Thanks for joining me this week on the Ocean Sailing Podcast and uh, thanks for following the show. Uh, if you want more information about the Ocean Sailing Podcast, go to oceansailingpodcast.com. If you want to subscribe to the show, you can do that via your, uh, your Apple or your Android device. Uh, so go to, the, go to the iTunes store directly or via the website. There's a number of options, a number of different apps you can use for subscribing to the Ocean Sailing Podcast. So please take advantage of that. We've got a Facebook group. That's some of our uh, members belong to. Uh, Ocean Sailing Podcast is called, so feel free to uh, become a member of that and uh, where you can uh, interact and chat with other members and share thoughts and feedback. Uh, the show succeeds because uh, I put a lot of time into it. Um, I do it uh, for two reasons. First of all, I love talking to people about sailing. I love sailing and uh, I spend a lot of time sailing. And I also do it because um, I'm uh, a member of a great club, South Yacht Club, and we're actively looking to grow our membership base and from, from boats to skippers to crew. And so uh, this helps spread the, the word about sailing. Uh, we're based in Southport in the Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia, and we've got listeners to the show that are in now in 93 countries around the world. So thanks for listening. Uh, if you want to contribute in some way to the show, uh, by all means, uh, you can go to oceansailingpodcast.com. You can become an Ocean Sailing patron. Uh, and if you want to make a donation on a monthly basis, there's details on the website as to how you can do that and some of the extra benefits you receive uh, for doing that as well. We get lots of suggestions, lots of ideas for people to interview, people to talk to. Please keep emailing those in. I follow all of them up. Not all people are available uh, immediately, but I have a long uh, and growing list of people in the pipeline to talk to uh, that, um, that really help me to put the show together and keep talking to different people about different things from different parts of the world so that the show remains fresh and interesting as well. So. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time on the Ocean Saving Podcast. I painted the future how it's
Some getting ready to die. 